Hello and welcome to the PCM Tech Help Show. I am your host, Craig Chamberlain, and this is the fifth episode of the live broadcast of PCM Tech Talk Live. As you know, I had to postpone this episode because yesterday I was sick, but um, I'm feeling a little better today. I think uh, I think I might be able to swing this whole thing. Uh, if I have to stop early, I'll be sure to let you know. Uh, you might notice a couple changes here in the format on the actual video stream. Now, I know some of you might just listen to these episodes, and you might not watch them and listen, uh, but I did download and purchase XSplit, so I'm able to actually add some features to the uh, titling and things like that. Again, it's all a work in progress. Um, now, remember, this PCM Tech Talk Live is, is for you, the subscribers, um, people who follow me on Facebook, YouTube, pretty much any network that you might follow me on. Uh, I kind of designated this entire live broadcast to you guys. I'd like to segue into doing a lot more of these, but really that depends heavily on the popularity of them and how well received they are. Um, when it says this thing is mirrored, uh, somebody says, is that a pro Oh, my text is backwards. Ha! Let's see what we got going on here. Let's see if I can fix that. And it looks like, uh, the, see, that's why I asked Nintendo, I'm glad people like you are here, because I can actually fix these problems as they occur. Let me go ahead and uh, give it a shot. Again, I'm new to XSplit, so bear with me. Um, this is going to be a process for me to get used to, and hopefully I don't drive you guys crazy in the process. <laughs> And that looks like it might have helped for the text. Let's see if I can fix the logo. Uh, logo. Let's see what we can do here for you. And let's try the... I was under the impression that it was going to confuse this for me. So it might have actually fixed the problem for me. Let's see what we got here then. Um, <clears throat> I won't know for a few seconds because it's actually broadcasting still here live. Um, let me go ahead and pause the audio here. Again, I apologize for this. But today, I'm going to talk about uh, generalized topics before you know I get to your questions. And your questions, they can be asked at any time. I'm hoping that uh, I get all this the technical difficulties worked out in the next few days. But I do want to start out by saying I am going to be segueing into a different time slot than the one I'm currently using. I did decide to use this time slot because I originally thought that I wouldn't be able to, I would be able to do a broadcast at 4 p.m. every day. And within two days, I realized that that wasn't going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> so I got off of that kick, and we're actually going to be moving into a live 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. time slot, which I think might end up working better for most people. Uh, I had to get I had to work something out with my wife to make that happen because we put the kid to sleep around that time, and I didn't want to interrupt that whole process. So now she's going to be watching the kid while I do this live broadcast. So you can thank her for that even being possible. So it looks like I have a little text floaty there. Uh, my OCD is getting the best of me. Let, me. let me change that real quick. I have too many spaces for the welcome to uh, in between the welcome to. So let me go ahead and... See if I can fix that. <laughs> yeah, I'm weird about this stuff. Hopefully, I won't drive you guys as crazy as I do myself. Um, anyways, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about live streaming again. Um, there's some questions that people had come up with while I wasn't doing the show. I didn't get a chance to answer them. Uh, and this was actually pertaining to the fact that the show isn't in high definition. It isn't broadcasted live in high definition. Uh, I think Eli made a good deal about this. Uh, Eli, the computer guy, he does uh, Everyman IT. Uh, I think he's pretty much cornered it on Eli, the computer guy now. Um, I was watching his live broadcast the other day and talking to him about it. And he does equate the, the YouTube version, the Google Plus Hangouts version of live broadcasting as sort of an AM radio type situation. Okay, Google Plus is still new. Uh, it doesn't broadcast in full HD yet. You actually broadcast in 360p, which is half of 720p. So you're looking at maybe one megapixel resolution or a little smaller than that if you multiply out the pixels. Now, that doesn't mean it's abhorrent or completely hideous, but obviously if you're watching this, 
uh, you notice that it's not in full HD. You don't get the full widescreen on the on the broadcasting. Now, in order for me to get full HD broadcasting, it is available. I'd have to go to something like uh, Ustream or Justin.tv. They do support those. But in order to do that commercially, we're talking quite a bit of money. If the show does progress as well as I want it to progress, that's not an unreasonable feat to try to pursue. So um, let me go ahead and get this broadcast out to everybody that's broadcasting live now. Uh, now that I think we've kind of got a good thing going here, uh, bring your questions, broadcast live, YouTube, blah, 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 blah. Send that. And this is what I do at the beginning of every episode. So if you follow me on the social networks, um, what I try to do before every episode is I will broadcast a 10-minute heads up so that people can jump into the actual show in advance. And then when they've jumped into the show, at that point they can wait for the feed to start at the 4 p.m. or upcoming 9 p.m. time slot. Once it's actually started at 9 p.m., I then rebroadcast again to all my social networks. So if you follow me on Facebook, on Twitter, or any of those, you will be given a heads up when the show actually debuts. And you can jump in it at any time and ask any questions at any time. Really, it's not going to affect whether or not I decide to whether I decide not to answer your question. Uh, your questions are what kind of drive the show, and so that kind of creates a cool environment for that. And uh, I'll, I'll have, like, generalized topics that I want to talk about in, in the meantime. So, okay, let's go ahead and get officially started here. I know we're kind of seven minutes into it, but, uh, again, we're overcoming some technical difficulties. And uh, the audio. Let's go into audio here. Recording audio uh, and creating a successful YouTube channel or anything is something I kind of wanted to talk about today. Creating YouTube channels is easy. Creating a YouTube channel is easy. Getting a YouTube channel popular can be difficult. It really depends on your ability to create things that are appealing and catchy. Uh, generating revenue and creating a popular YouTube channel tend to be two different things altogether. You can't really generate revenue with a YouTube channel without a steady subscriber or viewership base. And uh, you also, or in case you, unless you went viral on uh, certain videos, which of course it's like an exception to the rule. It's like winning the lottery. Uh, but uh, then eventually you get to apply for a YouTube partnership. And that all really kind of depends on your viewership. Now, YouTube has something called a partner program, and that's how they do that. They set it up so that you can actually subscribe or apply for a partnership contract, and then, well, not a contract, I'm sorry, a partnership application, and then when you've been accepted by Google for that partnership, they allow you to monetize your videos, given that you adhere to certain policies. I mean, of course, you can't steal other people's content. You can't post their content on yours as if it's your own. Uh, like, for me, mine's a lot of its educational purposes, and I have to be careful with what I post on here unless it is directly for educational purposes. So that's kind of one of the big things when you're creating a YouTube channel for the first time that you have to consider. Um, when you're first, you're like, I want to go into YouTube. Hang on, I just noticed my battery wasn't plugged in. When you go into YouTube for the first time, you're like, I'm going to go into this to make money. That's good. That's all well and good. You can make money. You can make a decent amount of money on YouTube. But take into consideration the fact that if you want to monetize the videos you're making now down the line, uh, you have to be careful with copyrights and, and things like that. So you can't use other people's music, you can't use other people's wallpapers, you can't use other people's products, essentially, without them at least applying to the fair use, which you'd have to look up and apply to your situation. Uh, but licensing is kind of a big concern for a lot of people with that. So once you kind of establish, <clears throat> once you kind of establish the situation where you have a channel, an idea, then it's a big part of being successful on YouTube is being consistent. And I've struggled with this myself over the lifetime of my channel. <clears throat> Consistency sounds like it's easy, but it, I guess it really depends on how busy you are. But it's very hard to stay interested in a subject for an extended period of time. That's the problem I always run into. So when you're talking about creating a channel that people can kind of rely on and depend on, think about all the big production value, production studios that are out there that are successful right now in the mainstream media. A lot of people go to them for their daily news or their daily dose of information because they're comfortable with them. They know what to expect. There's nothing, not, there's nothing, I would say, exciting about it, but it fits a need. Do you see what I mean? It's not necessarily wildly entertaining, 
but maybe it is wildly entertaining, but it's consistently entertaining in the same way. It doesn't constantly vary off of its platform. And there's been a lot of time and energy and studies and focus groups and millions of dollars of productivity put into that thought process and that production start situation that they want to make sure that the people who come back to them day to day are getting the same type of experience. So that's a there's a big important factor when it comes to consistency on any form of entertainment or media if you want to have a concurrent or consecutive audience. That's why when I say I'm switching to 9 p.m. it was very stressful for me to actually make that switch because of that consistency thing. I've already announced to a number of places that it's going to be 4 p.m. but of course it didn't work out for me but man I really wish I had known it wouldn't work out before I had made the announcement because now I need to go in and change it up on people and that causes that, you know what, forget this guy, that's too much trouble, he's inconsistent, you know, that's the kind of concern it does raise in, in me. So I don't want to create that kind of environment because consistency is very important. Uh, so if you're creating a YouTube channel and you want to create a successful product pretty much in any way, you want to make sure that that product is consistent. Um, <clears throat> the frustrating thing about that too is that like I said, you can get into a point where it's hard to stay interesting when you're talking about similar subjects or same content. So that, that's kind of a fine balance between consistency and entertainment and being cutting edge and edgy and things like that. So I don't want to overcomplicate YouTube. YouTube is still meant to be low production. It's not meant to be this super awesome, oh my god, you're this major production studio type environment. I mean, there's, there's a charm to the lower quality broadcast. There's a charm to the one-on-one -on -one interaction and engaging with the person making the content. There's things like that that give you the advantage over the standard broadcasting format, but uh, those things still are important and you should take them into consideration. So starting early on, just come up with some kind of a plan, whether it's in your head, you know, a lot of the big people say have it in writing, have your plan in writing, and then take that plan in writing and put it into practice, okay? Yeah, that sounds great on th in theory, but it is important that you have some kind of an idea of what do you want your show to be about. You can't have it be about um, pencil sharpeners and then have it be about <laughs> video games and then have it be about movies and then have it be about television. I mean, uh, television and movies are even pretty similar, but a lot of people bounce on, on their YouTube channels, they bounce around a lot. You know, and, and that's one of the biggest, I think, things I've seen happen to a lot of channels that are trying to succeed is that they keep bouncing. They don't take what they do really well and continue to do it. And I've noticed that weakness in myself. I mean, I'm not the only one. I'm not sitting here criticizing other people, but I've noticed that myself in my show. Because, uh, like, even now, I go back and I look over the last month of my videos, and I'm like, wow, I really didn't have any screencasts. Well, a big part of my show and what made it appealing early on were screencasts. And so now I'm like, well, now I got to work these back into my show. I got to get, I got to make time to do what originally people came to me to watch and to do. So I'm going to have to do that. I have to sit down and plan it out. And those things take time. But again, what I'm doing is I'm alienating that user base. If, if I switch all my content exclusively to this live broadcasting, then I've alienated the people who like the screencasts. If I do just screencasts, then I alienate the people who like the live broadcasting. Eventually, you have to come up with some kind of a medium that it's kind of like an evolving process. And this is a cool thing about YouTube-type media, YouTube-type broadcasting. You never find yourself in that kind of situation on any other form of multimedia ever in the past before. Conversation I was having with my cameraman the other day. He's in video production. His name is Chris Keyworth with Mastodon Productions. Got a name drop him. Got a name drop him. Um, Chris Keyworth is in professional production. Okay, he even works for a production studio. You create a situation in production where you, when you originally went to pitch an idea, you had to have a demo, you had to have the equipment. You had, if you didn't have the equipment, you had to find venture capitalists to invest in the equipment. And, and the whole idea behind creating a product was that before the product was even existed in any platform or any level, it had to be funded and it had to be established, and you had to find somebody who would take a huge chance, a huge financial risk on creating, on taking a chance with you, okay? 
and and that's kind of like has completely changed. YouTube has completely changed that. You have things like Google Hangouts. I can I can broadcast to you now, like my own radio show, within a few minutes of setup. And I have one hundred dollars for my microphone, hundred dollars for my webcam, and you can get a basic laptop that'll that'll utilize Google Plus. You have to have a Windows XP operating system to support your webcam and this. Oh, my software costs sixty bucks. So two hundred and sixty dollars, and I'm three sixty p resolution streaming, and it's capable of doing full ten eighty p if I had the monthly amount to broadcast live to all of you guys in full HD. I mean, that's insanely low budget for production. And so as a result of it being low production, I can evolve my platform and experiment with my platform with relative low risk and re relative ease. That's never before been possible. The reason I bring this up is because it actually creates a situation where you can start on YouTube early on creating a product and not even know what your niche is until your product has evolved over time. I've been on YouTube for about three years. I still don't really know what my niche on YouTube is going to be. But this, even this live broadcast is an experiment. So that's kind of what I wanted to get into there. I am going to go into some questions here because, like I said, this is more for you guys. But I, I, did, I wanted to finish my point on that. Uh, production's changed quite a bit, and, and they've kind of created a cool situation where technology in general has made a great situation where you can just become a professional broadcaster or attempt to be a professional broadcaster with very low production, you know, very low cost. Again, that makes the demand go up, though. I mean, the competition go up, which means you're competing with a lot more people who want to do this. But you can still get yourself out there. Very, very cool thing. Very cool thing. Okay. S Nintendog had said, um, the thing is mirrored. I do appreciate your help on that, S Nintendog. I did, I did fix it from what I can tell. Um, my question is, is on the Hangout, it might be mirrored backwards when, if people are watching me in a Hangout. But on my YouTube one, here, let me show you guys this. This is kind of funny. I, I'm looking at my screen right now, and um, hopefully I don't accidentally close broadcast as I did last time. I'm looking at my screen right now, and uh, I can see that the image is mirrored on one screen and not on the other. So I'm curious. I share my desktop. I'm sharing my desktop right now. I'm curious to see. Oh, you're not going to see it. Man, that stinks. Because if I show you my screen here, well, maybe I can. Maybe I can go back to the screen. Yeah, see? There it is. Oh, you probably missed it. Never mind. I can't do it. Apparently, if I switch to screen share on here, you won't see my text reversed. So it's mirrored on my screen, but it's not mirrored on the YouTube. Apparently, they flip it when it's being broadcasted to YouTube. So I don't know if it's being mirrored for people who are watching the broadcast or not either. So I'll be curious to see how that, all, how that pans out. People are like, oh, I don't even know where your channel's at, which could be true. Uh, Robert Wolf says better. Glad to hear that. Uh, them retarded horses. Interesting name. You were here on Monday, so it's good to have you guys back. S Nintendo as well. Uh, Robert Wolf, I think you were here as well. Uh, what is DDoSing? Uh, that is a good question. I, I've heard the term before. Oh, denial of service attacks. Yes, yes, yes. Denial of service attacks as a distributed denial of. Uh, and I pulled up Wikipedia immediate, immediately. This is the first thing I do so I can refresh my mind. Wikipedia is great because they'll give you pictures. Everybody loves pictures. Um, but denial of service attacks are a very popular way to create a distributed attack on a centralized location. Uh, a lot of people do it through viruses or malware. And what they'll do is, is they'll write a piece of software and they'll package it with another piece of software. And that piece of software packaged with it is a virus or a denial of service attack virus. And what they'll do is, is they'll have a orchestrated attack planned out. And then they'll distribute this virus, whether it be through some fake anti-malware software or even a known anti-malware software. They'll distribute this virus to as many systems as possible, and they'll lay dormant on those systems, is, is the most times how they do it. And around the world, this virus will remain dormant. Well, the virus is set to run at a scheduled time, send a ping or a large amount of data transfers directly to a single location or a single set of locations. And what that does is, is it causes an, a, an infrastructure, a data bandwidth overload on that location, and a denial of service attack will cause that location typically to crash because their servers can't handle the bandwidth load of all the attacks occurring simultaneously. Now let me pull up this picture here uh, and show you a little more detail here. Like I guess I love Wikipedia for this reason. Um, a lot of people say Wikipedia, unreliable source. Not true. Uh, 
it's not the Bible and you can't take it word for word or whatever. It's not the Bible of everything that you know or the encyclopedia, but it's a great source for information, especially when you need it in a short time notice, notice like I do. So let me pull up my screen share. I'm going to share my desktop here. And we're going to, I'll share just the Wikipedia page here. And I'm going to pull this up. Oh, and it gave me that. I was hoping it would give me a bigger picture, not the not code. Yay, Wikipedia. You gave me a picture thumbnail, and I can't look at it bigger. That seems odd to me. But, hey, I guess we'll cancel that part then. Because they had a cool little picture that showed how they did it. And then basically they differentiate the they don't differentiate they keep the attack centralized on one location but they distribute the source of the attack that way the person often doing the attack is unaware that they're doing it because it's usually a ton of systems that are accumulated uh, let me pull up my YouTube page here here we go I'm getting used to this format, by the way. I apologize about all this inconvenience. But that's what DDoSing is. It's a denial of service attack. Um, they, they become more and more popular, and a lot of people are taking down networks with them and things like that. So it's really kind of like a shady way to pick on bigger banking companies, competition do it. China does it all the time to uh, companies that they're competing with. I hate to say it, but they, have, they don't have as strict regulations on things like that. So... Let's look at the next one. Um, next question. Raw Billy Jean says, once they kick you out of AdSense from you, can you have it again in the future? I just want to make money from my videos. But then one day I might cancel my AdSense account, but they keep my channel. Now, that, that's an excellent question. What you have to do is, is you have to file a, <laughs> you have to file a, what's it called, a dispute with Google AdSense, uh, recover, Google AdSense account. Let me see if I can find the actual location here. Um, they, they are pretty reluctant to do this. If you've been denied once, it's very difficult to recover it. It is possible to create a new AdSense account. Uh, I don't think that's against their terms of service. You'd want to double check, but I'm pretty sure you can create a new AdSense account and connect it to your YouTube channel as a different AdSense account. But once a certain AdSense account has been shut down, it's very, very, very difficult to get it recovered. Um, a lot of people, a lot of reasons for this occur. Uh, illegitimate clicks, um, click attacks, which is unfortunate. That can bring down somebody's AdSense account. Uh, fraudulent clicks is the number one source of the reason for that. Uh, not having the proper terms of service and compliance, you have to make sure you have a privacy policy on your home page if you have them on your website. Uh, and there's a whole, you got to read the terms of service pretty clearly. They, they clearly define what's considered a legitimate and illegitimate click and what procedures you have to follow to comply properly with AdSense. Uh, you can't share your revenue. I mean, there's things like this that are all in there. Um, but let me go down here and see if there's an actual location. Right now I'm in a forum. Uh, it says contact them by phone. Don't think your site has a second chance. I, from what I've heard, it's not not doesn't look good. Uh, just in general, I've seen people float around and complain about it quite quite a bit. Um, here's an actual product forums from Google. Uh, I've come to the conclusion the end of my account. If Google has terminated your personal account, you can never have another personal account in your lifetime. Changing email addresses won't help you in that respect. Wow, that's rough. It says, please read the policy and FAQ at google.com slash support slash AdSense thread. Okay, the only route is to seek reinstatement by submitting, submitting an appeal. See, we learn something new every day on here. So you're looking for this. What should I do? In case it was disabled because of the non-policy violation. Okay, I need to get you this link somehow. Uh, but you need to go here and you need to try to appeal their shutdown. And then you got to hope that they will actually recover it for you. Um, that's kind of scary. That's why they say if you're going to monetize your website, don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's a scary, scary thing. Because if, you've, if you depend heavily just on one revenue stream, uh, if they decide tomorrow morning, sorry, buddy, uh, then you're out of luck. 
what am I going to do here? Post your email. Uh, wait, no, wait. Here, you're, you're raw Billy Jean. So I'm going to open this in a new tab. I'm going to send you this link. Okay. If it'll let me send you messages, and it will not. Uh, email me, Craig at PCMTechHelp.com, and I will mail you this link. And I will also post it in the video description when we are done with this video. So, I mean, I wish I could do it right now, but there's I can't post links in the chat, and we're going to have to come up with a solution to that. Um, I can see now why people kind of segue into IRC chats instead of using the embedded chat. Google won't let me post a link here on the YouTube chat. Otherwise, I would post that. I just Googled um, the categories AdSense, AdSense, Basics, and Policies. Uh, Google the words, my account was disabled, what should I do for AdSense? And, and you should probably get that to come up. So let's go ahead and uh, go on to the next one. And if you, do, you can't find it, send me an email, Craig at PCMTechHelp.com, and I will try to get this link to you. Or wait till the video is done, because it won't let me put it in the video description right now either. So... S Nintendo thought of a question. I have a computer from 2000 running Windows ME. Should I bother fixing it or scavenge it for parts and the case? Cool thing to do with older systems is to build servers out of them. Uh, Ventrilo server is really popular if you like to do video games. Ventrilo is kind of a, just a chat server. Uh, you could do a Linux file sharing server. Maybe you just go out and buy a uh, just go buy a hard drive, a big hard drive for it, and stick the hard drive in there shove it in a corner in your basement, stick an Ethernet cable in it, and then, you know, after you've set it up, set it up with Linux to do file sharing, and then stick an Ethernet cable in it, shove it in a corner of your basement, and then you have your own remote storage. Uh, I called them my... I, I used to have a lot of older machines. That's what I would do with them. I'd experiment with them. Uh, as far as re fixing it, I don't know. I mean, if it's going to cost you a lot of money, obviously it's not worth it. Uh, but I don't know how much you're going to get in the way of scavenging it either. I mean, if it was from 2000 and it's Windows, Windows ME, it could be, at this point, just a big paperweight. But it could handle menial tasks and small servers quite well. I mean, 2000, you could have your own mail server, you could have your own FTP server, you could have your own standard Windows file share server. You'd come up with a lot of different cool things you can do with it if you just, you know, kind of sit down and try to get creative with it, especially if you found a Linux distribution that would do something that you'd want it to do. So that's kind of a, a way, what I would do with it. Uh, and if you don't really are inter aren't interested in that at all, at all, then I would probably, I'd probably junk it myself. I don't even know what to do with hardware that old anymore. I don't even know, uh, recycle it. Uh, give it to Goodwill. That's a good thing to do. You can give it to like Salvation Army or Goodwill. A lot of people would love to have a, any computer. So that happens from time to time. I've done that just to get it out of my basement or out of my garage. I had one from 1998, and I had another junker that was newer than that junker. So <laughs> I, the junked junker, the junker of the junker, I ended up just giving away because it's like, I think I sold one at a garage sale for 20 bucks also. So I mean, there's, there's things you can do with it. It just really depends on what you want to do. So uh, the next question uh, from Sprelusi says, hello, Craig. Hi. And it says, are you enjoying Windows 8? Because I'm not. I have mixed feelings about Windows 8. Um, I've talked about it a couple times, and this is a popular topic, so I'm not going to avoid it. It's pretty much any time I'm getting viewers on here that are asking me about Windows 8. So obviously it's on everybody's mind. Uh, Windows 8, as I've said before, is not a standard operating system for desktop users. It's not meant for desktop users. But it's forced down desktop users' throats because Windows wants you to get used to their tablet interface. Because tablets, as they know, and touchscreen, as they know, is going to be the future of computing. And so they've kind of found themselves in this awkward marketing situation where they can't keep up with the competition that Apple and Android are putting in front of them. So they've kind of, as this ditch effort, forced this interface onto users so that they can get used to the Windows mobile tablet interface so that when they go out to buy their tablets, they're more inclined to select the Microsoft product rather than the Apple or Android product. And it's really unfortunate that they've done this. I'm not saying that the Metro UI is completely worthless. It is a, it's a cool interface if you have a touchscreen. It really is. It's a cool interface. I love it on my Xbox. They don't call it the Metro UI, but it's the same style. Okay, the Windows Phone, it's great on that. It's a cool interface for the phone, but it's just not a desktop interface. And that's kind of the problem that they've created. But 
They want to force it on you so that you have to get used to it. It's unfortunate, but that's why I have mixed feelings about it. I don't think there's any distinct advantage of Windows 8 over Windows 7 at all. I think all the UI adjustments made in 8 don't add any value. I use the term value added because they created a new user interface that's supposed to improve your experience. That's the whole point of creating a new user interface. The problem is, is it will improve your experience only if you use a touch screen or a tablet, but there's no value added to a desktop situation. So there's no real need to switch from Windows 7 to 8 on a desktop environment. In fact, you're actually going backwards in productivity and efficiency if you do so, just because the interface doesn't allow for that. Even after you've gotten used to it, I know a lot of people are like, well, you're just not used to it. I'm not saying it's a bad user interface. It's, it's actually a pretty decent, solid user interface, but it's not a desktop one. So if you're using a desktop computer, you're never going to be more efficient on it than you were on a Windows 7 computer. It's just not going to happen. That's, it just wasn't designed for that purpose. So I think it's kind of an unfortunate thing. Uh, I think for desktop PCs, it'll actually be the next Vista. People are going to run screaming from it as fast as they possibly can as soon as an alternative is available. Uh, but again, it's just so that they can push out their mobile platform into the market and, you know, force it down your throat. I mean, that's, unfortunately, that's what Microsoft's been doing lately because I don't know who's in charge of their product development and their marketing, but they have been so behind the curve on mobile since the beginning that this is something dramatic that they had to do. I mean, just to keep their product in front of people's faces. It's just there's too many alternatives coming out now, and I think it's terrifying them, to be honest with you. I mean, in a few years, are we even going to be using laptops, you know? They're going to be laptop touchscreen hybrids, if, if anything else. They're going to be both in one. And so maybe that, you know, that's the market they're trying to get to. So next question, is there anything like Skype but safe and secure? Is Skype not safe and secure? Um, you got me again, them retarded horses. Skype secure. Can't you do SSL encryption through Skype? Skype secure. Help from Skype. Skype is as secure as we can possibly make it. Very, your call is very strongly encrypted, ensuring your privacy. The same is true of your shared files, chats, and video. Are Skype downloads safe? And, you know, this is interesting. I just typed Skype security, and this is their site, and they go into pretty good detail. What, what encryption do they use? Does Skype use encryption? Uh, Skype uses AES. That's incredibly secure, actually. Uh, advanced encryption standard known as Rigendale, which is used by the U.S. government to protect sensitive information. And Skype uses the maximum 256-bit encryption. So what uh, what is it that you've experienced that you've been led to believe that Skype is insecure, I guess would be my next question. Uh, from the looks of it, if that's the case, um, if it uses AES encryption, you're you're fine. I mean... You have to have somebody really wanting to get your information to go through as much trouble as you have to go through to hack into that and to monitor your activity. Now, of course, encryption is only as secure as encryption is. I mean, I know that sounds obviously redundant, but an encryption can't secure you from a local virus capturing all of your audio and video. I mean, obviously, Skype can't protect you from that. Uh, even if somebody's trying to enter... Inter, you know, interfere with you wirelessly, they still got to decrypt the data. You know, it's, it's not like they can just go out and grab your, your broadcast and say, oh, I'm going to find out what uh, them retarded horses is talking about today. And so it's not like they can just do that. I mean, they have to actually have a direct connection or an invite into that tunneled connection so that they can actually decrypt it and see what's going on in that conversation. So I'd say it's pretty efficient to be honest with you so okay let's move up to Adam trailer Adam trailer does write for me um, Adam trailers a good writer good guy uh, what's up my friend I was watching on Google Plus moved over here it seems this is more live place to be I'm trying to move everything to this location actually because to be honest with you I think Google Plus and Google Hangouts is going to be the live broadcasting of the future. I don't think I'm alone in that. After all, Eli uses it, right? Because I just saw that Eli came in here. Since he did it to me, my guy Eli. 
Um, but his rhymes, so that's kind of cooler than mine was. But um, Google Plus is great, but there's not enough people on there really to make it exclusively on Google Plus. Uh, but YouTube is where all the videos at. It's where it's fed. Uh, and as you probably have noticed, Google is going to make a heavy, have already, and they're going to continue to make a heavy trend of melding all of their social media type stuff with YouTube and Blogger, and pretty much all their networks, they want to be tied together. You'll notice this especially in the YouTube, the new YouTube interface, which I think has killed our CTR for this month, um, that and a lot of other variables. But uh, what you find here is that they're melding the interface. They've already tied in Google Plus to YouTube so that you actually can connect your YouTube account to your Google Plus account, right? So then when you're leaving comments, now your profile image shows up. But they do it right. You know, they don't just, you wake up one morning and boom, you're stuck with this huge, massive overhaul of a change that nobody likes. It's small bit and piece modifications, but they're going to be moving, they're going to be melding the YouTube, Google Plus live stream, and YouTube as one single centralized product, which is why I've actually decided that this is going to be my primary location for actually broadcasting. Because to be honest with you, I don't see any benefit other than it being an HD uh, to move to like Ustream or Justin.tv. Um, I think they're going to fix this chat issue. I think they're going to, I think they're going to come in here and they're probably going to move the comment system into more of a chat system on Hangouts. I, I could foresee that happening. Um, but there's a lot of things that, you know, they got the automatic updates. They implemented that in a while back. So they're like kind of segueing into it, but they don't want to make such a dramatic change overnight that it causes a situation for a lot of their user base. So I think they're going about it the right way. But uh, you'll, you're going to see me doing this consistently. Now, maybe Eli knew this, maybe he didn't, but the current max resolution on this live stream for Google Plus Hangouts is 360p. So that's half of 720p. I've said that earlier in the video. So you're in a situation now where you can really only broadcast in, I think it's like 0.5 or 1 megapixel if you multiply it out. But, you know, like that's not going to get any better. You know, I, like I find it hard to believe that Google's not going to eventually try to compete on the same level as Ustream and Justin.tv. But they're not going to force that infrastructure in place if they can't stabilize it. I wouldn't expect them to. So if I can broadcast consistently at 360p and I don't run into problems, I'll accept that format for now. But I do expect them to segue into a higher definition broadcasting because that's what people expect. And so that's going to happen. So welcome to the live stream. It's been fun. It's been fun so far. I like the questions. I always like having questions. So hola, Eli. Welcome to the live broadcast. Hopefully uh, you're not bored. <laughs> Raw Billy Jean. I appealed to Google AdSense and they sent me a generic reply saying that I was denied. Also, I heard that since you give your social security number to them, they do not let you open another AdSense with the same social security number. I don't know if it's true. I think we just kind of verified that earlier when we were talking. You got to be very careful with AdSense. Um, it scares me how dependent I am on them for revenue right now, but I'm small time. So there's not like, I can't go out and get sponsored. You know, I can't go out and get, I don't have a huge pitch for things like that right now. Uh, there's a lot of alternative revenue sources out there for broadcasting, but a lot of them are just numbers based. You have to have the numbers and the traffic in order to push through either the conversion rates or the click through rates. I mean, you've got things like info links, which info links is a good way to have embedded ads on your website. But if you don't get 100,000 views a month, it's not worth it. You're not going to make any money, and even at 100,000 views a month, you're probably not. I, you're probably not going to make much. I mean, even Chris Perillo was using Conterra and Info or Infolinks. He, I know he used Conterra. I think he even didn't even bother with Infolinks. But he said he eventually he just dropped it because it didn't do anything to the bottom line. Those embedded link advertising, just because you need such massive numbers to really generate any true revenue out of it. Uh, there's also, uh, I know, I know Amazon has conversion based so you could like try to sell products through your website or through your broadcast like I could say check out this awesome new mouse you can buy it through my link below and if you bought it through my link below then I would get a percent of commission on that sale I've contemplated doing that I may actually eventually do that because like there's a lot of products that I think are worth talking about but the problem is I have to go out and buy the products I can't afford to go out and just buy products 
to so I'd like to have like some kind of a sponsor, some kind of thing worked out. I think the point is here is that AdSense it isn't the only thing out there. So if you're if you're okay, let's just say you're out of luck with AdSense. We talked about this. You're out of luck. There's two AdSense alternatives, and I've heard good things about them. Uh, I don't know the names off the top of my head. I'm gonna pull it up. Techno Buffalo, Buffalo, great great source for information. The top five that they recommend are AdBright. I have no personal experience with AdBright. They're worth looking into. Bidvertiser. I haven't heard of them either. Chitika, Chitika, that's a real popular one. Uh, I've heard people argue that, is it Chitika or Chitika? C-H-I-T-I-K-A. I've heard people argue that this actually results in more revenue than AdSense, but you can't use them uh, in slew with AdSense, I believe, because it's contextual. You can't use two contextual ad services together when you're talking about AdSense. You can use static ads along with your AdSense, but you can't use two contextually based with the same ad size. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, Clicksore, never had any experience with them, and it looks like they got this e -click Z, which sounds suspicious to me. I don't know if I'd go into that one. But start looking into alternatives while you dispute your AdSense account. There's no sense in just letting it sit there and, you know, dry out. And if you're having a problem because it's for your YouTube videos, like you said, you may have to start embedding your YouTube videos into a website. Build your own website, embed your videos into that, and start advertising your website as your centralized location rather than the YouTube site, which you should be doing anyway, to be honest with you. Because if you're relying on a third-party ad service and a third-party production service exclusively for all of your content, you're going to run into some serious problems down the line like you already have with you got cut off on the financial side. Well, now all your content's on their network now. You see what I mean? Um, another thing for that you could look into is blip.tv. They're kind of big on co aggregating um, productions as well. So you can actually upload your videos to blip.tv and it'll distribute it across some other video networks like Vimeo, uh, YouTube, and it'll actually embed ads within your videos before they hit YouTube or before they hit Vimeo. So you actually will get the ad advantage, advantage of your content and you'll have hard copies of your content as well. There's a lot of great things about Blip TV. I think they take too much as a margin, but hey, you're, you're not looking at a lot of alternatives here. Uh, but hey, that at least diversifies your income. You see what I mean? And there's no reason you can't use Blip TV in conjunction with uh, AdSense or this other company. Set yourself up on a website, get yourself up on uh, Blip.tv, which probably would be my strongest suggestion out of the box, and start distributing your video content through blip.tv and have it uploaded directly to your YouTube channel. But make sure your centralized location is one location. You gotta push everybody to one location. It's either gonna be your website or your YouTube channel. So that's why a lot of times on mine you'll see that if you wanna go to my YouTube channel, I'll say go to pcmtechhelp.com slash YouTube. So that way I'm kind of insinuating I'd rather you go to pcmtechhelp.com because that's where I'd rather you go as my primary source because you can connect to me through anything on that one source so that's that's why I kind of adopted that philosophy and I, I, I hope that kind of at least solves your problem at least gives you a little comfort AdSense isn't the only thing out there and if they shot you down for legitimate or illegitimate reasons don't stop harassing them keep disputing it dispute it till your face turns blue but don't sit there and wait for them to respond to get your venture running. You don't want to depend on one person to get your venture up and running. Never a good thing. Never a good thing. So I hope that helps. Um, find a hard to use Windows 8 since I'm so used to Linux style UIs. Really? Sproluci. Linux style UIs. Are you talking like Ubuntu? Because Ubuntu is awesome. I, uh, I don't have a lot of experience with Linux other than like core servers, you know, setting them up for specific single functions web servers, uh, mail servers, FTP, things like that. I've done that with Linux, but I've never actually used one as a production, like full desktop computer. I do all my work through it type situation. I just got way too used to Windows. <laughs> and I just didn't have the patience. But Ubuntu is fantastic. I gotta, I'm not going to lie. I just installed Ubuntu on my desktop the last time I did it. And to be honest with you, it, it's awesome. I think they did a great job. And I've actually been recommending it to people who have Windows 8 as a solid alternative, as an operating system. You can go to their website, download it for free, burn it to a CD, stick it in your computer on boot up, wipe out Windows 8, 
install Linux Ubuntu, hey, you got to learn a whole new user interface anyway, right? Now the problem you're going to run into with that is if you depend heavily on Microsoft software, it's not going to work on Ubuntu Linux. So that's something to consider. But it is a great alternative if you're just like, you know what? There's, alter there's free alternatives out there for Ubuntu for Word and Excel and PowerPoint, and they got alternatives for all that stuff. So you don't have to worry about that. They'll probably even open up all your files. I'd be shocked if they didn't. Shocked. So something to consider for those of you who are absolutely hating Windows 8. You can go to Ubuntu. Don't even pay the money. Don't even buy Windows 7. Say, Microsoft, you know what? You pissed me off. I'm going to switch to Linux. And you, you know, consumer's choice, you know. It drives the economy. Good stuff. Them Retarded Horses says, hacking. I'm pretty sure you're referring to the DDoS attacks. So we will go ahead and keep going. Robert Wolf. I think Windows 8 is pretty, but I cannot see it practically in a business office environment. Personally, I don't like the full screen apps. I completely agree. Uh, and you're running into the same thing I was talking about before. Windows 8 isn't a desktop environment operating system. Metro UI isn't meant to be a desktop operating system. Metro UI is bundled with desktops just so you are forced to get used to their Metro UI so that you buy their tablets in two years. It's, it's, it's sad that I'm saying that, but it's true. I, I've historically loved Microsoft. I think this is a big blunder on their part. I think they're taking their user base for granted, and I think they're under-anticipating their user base switching to alternatives that are quickly becoming more and more available. Ubuntu, for example, was never available when they released Vista in the form that it's in now. Uh, Chromium laptops, Google laptops, most of the people are using internet and web anyway. You're talking a $250 laptop with a built-in browser OS. That's starting to look pretty appealing if you can't get anything done on your Windows 8 computer. Um, Android tablets, iPad tablets can pretty much do what most people want to do on their desktops already. So people are wanting to jump on those. So releasing a Windows 8 UI, Metro UI, just to give people headaches so that they get used to their tablet might just piss them off enough to say, you know what, can't I just get an iPad and not deal with this computer anymore? It's not that unrealistic of a thought. You know, the basic user doesn't want a complex user interface. They want, to, they want to perform a task, and they want to perform it efficiently. And if you have a UI that's in the front of their face, is that even if they master it, they're not more efficient at their job, you're creating a really negative mindset on their products, which for your core user base is not what you want to do. I'm sorry. You just don't want to do it. It's a terrible idea. It's, uh, somebody should get fired for it if they haven't already. I don't pay enough attention to the news. So I agree completely. I, there's no reason to put a Windows 8 computer in a work environment at all until you're forced to, which is what they're going to try to do. Terrible idea. That's why a lot of businesses, a lot of businesses, and I get a lot of flack for this because I do Windows XP videos still, a lot of businesses, 25% of my user base uses Windows XP still, in businesses especially. Why? Because it's stable. It works. It's familiar. Windows XP is one of the best operating systems ever created. So there's, if it works, there's no real reason to switch unless you absolutely have to or security and viruses become a concern. So same with Windows 7. There's no reason to switch to 8. None whatsoever. Now, of course, they jacked up the price of Windows 7 to like $300 so that you can buy Windows 8 for 40, 40 to 60 bucks or you can buy Windows 7 for $300, which is insane. And I mean, you can buy the OEM for $150. But e either way, it's insane that they do this. It's annoying. OK, then retarded horses. What can people do to you if they know your IP address? Well, it just depends. Um, to you personally, physically? Physically, I don't think they can do a whole lot unless they're so proficient in networking that they can somehow extrapolate your physical location based on your IP address. That would be quite a feat because they'd have to hack the ISP, the local ISP, and even then they don't really track that information as psychotically as you would expect them to because their IPs float a lot. You know, they're constantly, I mean, they do statics, but for most people who are consumer-based, they're dynamic IPs, which means they change. So they don't really track IP addresses as much as you would think they do. 
Um, they do from time to time uh, because they do monitor like bandwidth. So like if there's a huge surge in bandwidth usage in one location, then they send out notification letters uh, for, you know, yeah, you've been doing suspicious activity. You know, I'm talking about pirating, not really bandwidth bandwidth. They're not going to send you a letter for using bandwidth usually. Unless it's a lot of bandwidth. Like, you'd have to be pirating a lot of movies in order to use that much bandwidth. So uh, they can't really do a whole lot. I mean, they can, they, if they know your, phys your IP address, uh, physically they can't do a lot. If they know your IP address, they can access your router. If you, don't, if you don't change your router password, your default router password, typically they can access your router remotely. If the router wasn't pre-configured to firewall that out, they could go in there and shut down your wireless or add a password to mess with you to your wireless. I've seen people do that. Um, there's nothing funnier than when I'm in an area and they have an unsecured wireless network. Um, I usually, I'm not, a, I'm not a hacker, so I'll usually, if it's a neighbor, I'll tell them that, hey, I can, and they're like, oh, well, I don't mind sharing my information with everybody. It's like, well, you don't understand, all right? You're responsible for that network address. People can use your network to download illegal porn. They can download illegal movies, illegal games, and guess who's liable for that? It's not them. It's you as the paying service provider. You've got to be careful with, you don't want to just be a nice guy and share your network with anybody. Because you're running into a situation where you don't know what they're going to be doing with your network. They could hack the U.S. government for all I know. And guess whose house they're going to show up at? Yours. So uh, there, there are some DDoS attacks they can do uh, if you just have a standard st static address. Um, they could get into your network relatively easily if you have no security set up. A lot of time your standard router will discourage the average person from getting in. They're more looking for people who have a direct modem connection to the PC. The new Windows operating systems have really good built-in firewalls, so anymore they do have to jump through quite a few ho hoops. A lot more than guys just, they rely on phishing hacks more than they do actual, I'm going to go through hardcore and IP address route, tunnel through their router hacks. You know, they do a phishing scam where they send you a piece of software or an email or a link on Facebook and it gets you to download an app locally to your computer, then they can remote desk, they can tunnel in, remote desktop into your computer, and then do whatever the heck they want. Or drop adware and spyware in the background. That's more what people do now than they do direct hacking attacks through the IP address. I think there's more money in it. I think that's why they do it. So, so let's go up to the next question. Sprolucy, them, they can't really do much beside DOS or Shell. Uh, same thing. Or track which doesn't always work. Yeah, that's true. Um, Endless031. Oh, oh, crap. I always play DayZ when you go live and I forget about the stream. Well, Endless, you might be happy or sad to know that this stream is going to be moving to 9 p.m. on weekdays because I, in my infinite wisdom, didn't realize how much of an issue this was going to cause for me on my work schedule. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can get off work at the same exact time every day. In retrospect, that's the most insane thing I've ever concluded in my mind. So I don't know where I got that from. But now all the broadcasts are going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern, which will probably work out better because West Coast will be 3 p.m., East Coast will be 9 p.m. People aren't really going to sleep yet. They're kind of winding down for the day on East Coast. And then on West Coast, they're just getting off work, and they may have just eaten dinner, so they might be interested in hanging out and asking a couple questions. I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe it'll work out. I don't know. So. Raw Billy Jean, thank you for the info. No problem. Um, I hope that it works out for you. I just skipped a question. I just, I hope that information works out for you. Again, if you have questions, you can email me, craig at pcmtechhelp.com. More than happy to receive your guys' questions. Uh, I've answered quite a few of them in the past week or so, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. So, just, again, don't, don't hesitate to send me a message. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and on, obviously on YouTube. Uh, send me an invite. You know, this is what I like to do, so that's why I'm here. Uh, Robert Wolf says, if Microsoft continues with the Windows 8 format, do you think Linux might gain market share as an alternative? Absolutely. Uh, especially when you have uh, Ubuntu marketing a, a phone now. I actually didn't even know this existed, uh, but Ubuntu is in, in the business of creating a hybrid between their phones and their uh, 
Ubuntu operating system. And if you've used the Ubuntu operating system, you understand why. It's like an app-based app operating system. But of course, their main target market now is business. Well, guess what's going to happen when the businesses have to switch to Windows 8? Okay, we're talking these massive companies. Uh, they're going to say, okay, well, these guys aren't idiots. Okay, they're IT divisions and departments. They're not idiots. They're not going to sit there and go, Oh, well, we got to upgrade to Windows 8 because our newer software package won't work with uh, Windows 7 anymore. So uh, I guess we're just going to have to get used to Windows 8. No, they're going to be doing testing, user-based testing. They're going to be doing, uh, seeing what all the possible alternative options are. And Microsoft has already historically lost a lot of business to Linux uh, for efficiency reasons, not just uh, user-based reasons. Uh, but just hardware security, uh, software security, and just operating system performance. They've lost a lot of traction. Not, I mean, UI was always like a head. UI was always something they could bank on with Windows. Oh, yeah, but, but they'll be used to it, you know? It'll be, you know, they've been using Windows forever. It, there's no reason to switch away from it. Our users will go insane if we do that. Well, now they've taken that away from them, you know? So they're going to be looking at all the alternatives. And I think that when they look at the pricing and they look at uh, all the headaches, I think there will be a lot of situations where Linux will make a lot more sense than Windows 8. I think that's going to continue to progress down that way until they basically get their get themselves together. Microsoft gets themselves get some kind of actual business plan in motion that'll work. I think feasibly. Uh, I don't think Windows 8 is a very good idea on any level, to be honest with you. So. Next question, uh, Bro Lucy, I'm talking Ubuntu, GNOME 3 and 2, KDE, XFCE, and LXDE. It's worth a shot, and you should try it out with other desktops. You know what? I should. You know, I should copy and paste this list because I love the virtual box operating systems. I'm going to. I'm going to copy and paste this list, and I am going to check these out because I haven't used a lot of what you've already, what you just said, to be honest with you. Like I've told you, Never been a big Linux guy for basic desktop use, um, but that doesn't mean I'm not always trying to learn. So I went ahead and did that. I saved it. So you said you're about to dump Windows 8 and go back to Linux. Well, you're used to Linux, so I can't can't uh, can't blame you. <laughs> uh, I'm running out of time here. I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to shoot through these last few questions, and I'm going to thank you guys and uh, do my outro. Okay, a girl from the gym one. I'm thinking about using Ubuntu. Does it have plug and play drivers? Of course, it does. Yes, it has plug and play drivers for the majority of devices. If you're talking about a very niche device, you're going to want to Google it and Google the model number and then type the word on and then type the word Ubuntu and do a little bit of homework. If you have hardware that you absolutely have to have work on the new operating system, do a little bit of legwork, and it'll save you a lot of headaches. But it does have plug-and-play drivers. It will install drivers out of the box. But if you have a very specific piece of hardware that you have to have, you always want to double-check before switching operating systems whether or not that piece of hardware will work with it. And it might require a little bit of homework. You might need to send an email to the people who made the product. Say you've got a Microsoft LifeCam webcam. You, if you're afraid it won't work with Linux, you can send Microsoft support a request or call their support on their Microsoft LifeCam website uh, and ask them, hey, I'm going to install Linux. And you might talk to two or three people who have no idea. Hang up the phone, call them back. I usually keep calling until I find somebody who knows what they're talking about. And then complain by the third time and say, hey, I've talked to three people about this already. Nobody can answer my question. Uh, or you can install it on a virtual box. I don't know if you've ever used VirtualBox before, but it's a dream come true. Uh, well, that's not a really good test of hardware, though. I don't want to say that, because VirtualBox emulates hardware drivers. Scratch that, uh, because it will give an emulated driver from the host operating system, and that's something completely different. So we won't even segue into that. So. Then Retarded Horses says, I mean, to your computer and Internet. Hacking to your computer and Internet. They will... Uh, I think I did cover that. Yeah, was, I'm running on a delay here, a video feed delay. I think I did cover that. Yes, they can theoretically hack into your system if they know your IP address because they know your physical location. But it's a lot of work anymore because the, the hardware that comes standard is pretty well protected as long as you actually go in and set the passwords and stuff. 
And TAS GR, if Windows 8 is not good with that UI, think about Windows 8 Server Edition. Ah! <laughs> there's a Server Edition. Yes, there is a Server Edition of Windows 8. Oh, God, what a laugh it was. Oh, my. that's a good one to close it out with. That's all i got to tell you, Taz. Well, if there are any other, it looks like there's a couple other questions here. Um, uh, it looks like there's a couple more that popped up here. Uh, that's hilarious, Taz. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Ubuntu has tons of drivers. It depends on which drivers you want. As proprietary, you can install. Thank you for sharing, sharing that, Spro Lucy. Uh, do you think IPv4 will be replaced by IPv6? Uh, yes. The difference is how, much, how many addresses are available. Uh, it will be replaced eventually, and they've made amazing strides in making that transition as seamless as possible. You will notice if you go into your Windows 7 or 8 drivers for your networking protocol, there's an IPv4 and an IPv6 available addressing available. So the idea is, is if they switch over to IPv6, you will be already ready to migrate to the new system under DHCP. So you'll notice that that's been a huge movement in the past year, no, four years. So I think they'll be well prepared for it when it happens. But it gives you two extra addressing areas, which means, because we're running out of IP addresses actually, it, which means basically you're adding two whole new variations to the 255 network region, which is an unfathomable amount of IP addresses, really. Endless, I look forward to seeing you at 3 a.m., it looks like, Endless 031. Well, that's all we have for today. Um, I'm going to have to call it close. we still got 12 viewers. I really appreciate you guys coming by. Remember, the new broadcasting time will be at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that would be 6 o'clock West Coast time, I believe. Uh, you can find out if I'm broadcasting live at my website in the upper right-hand corner. I have a little box that shows me broadcasting live. It has the time right on there. Uh, I try to put it up there every day, and the last feed will be on there too. Uh, follow me on Google+, Plus because every time I broadcast live, it posts there. I do share it on all of my social networks when I start broadcasting. I usually give you a 10 minutes head up, heads up, and then I announce the actual broadcast. So I kind of try to get both ends of the spectrum done there. So if you follow me on Facebook, Twitter, um, YouTube, uh, obviously, Google+, and LinkedIn, you should be notified. Or you can follow my Facebook page as well, So because I have a Facebook page as well. You will be notified when a broadcast is about to go live. So as always, thanks again. Don't forget to like this video before you leave. If you like it, that helps me out. Uh, I always appreciate your comments. Don't stop coming because uh, I'm having a lot of fun with this, and I look forward to doing it more and more. I'm addicted already. And it's only been my third, my fifth episode. Five. And by the way, the sense set's going to get nicer too. I have my professional cameraman, Chris Keyworth, coming in over the weekend to help me set up my studio to be a little more professional. So hopefully we'll get all the lighting taken care of, and we'll actually look like a real show. <laughs> so thanks again, everybody. I will see you tomorrow night. 9 p.m. So have a wonderful, wonderful day. <laughs>